Approach to Abdominal Pain by Dr. Patty Stuck. By the end of this video, you should be able to recognize important historical features in patients with abdominal pain. Select physical examination maneuvers to identify specific causes of abdominal pain. Formulate a focus differential diagnosis based on patient age, pain localization and exam findings. Plan laboratory testing and identify clinical scenarios where imaging studies are warranted for the evaluation of abdominal pain. Introduction Abdominal pain is a common pediatric complaint and frequent reason for acute visits. While most episodes result from self-limited conditions needing only supportive care, it is crucial to identify serious disease requiring prompt intervention. History Correct diagnosis of abdominal pain relies on accurate medical history. A detailed history will investigate for red flags and help identify the cause of pain. Like other pain conditions, initial interview should include onset and timing, location, obvious triggers, and what worsens or alleviates the pain. Description and localization of abdominal pain may be difficult for younger patients, but they may be able to point to where they have the pain. Other symptoms associated with the abdominal pain may help distinguish causes. For example, fever is associated with infectious or inflammatory etiologies like gastroenteritis, referred pain from pneumonia, pyelonephritis, cholecystitis, cholangitis, and appendicitis. Vomiting may suggest gastroenteritis or serious abdominal pathologies. A careful description of the emesis is helpful. Bilious emesis elicited by asking about green vomit is concerning for intestinal obstruction and is often a surgical emergency. One cause of abdominal pain with bilious vomiting is midgut volvulus in the setting of malrotation. Malrotation occurs during embryonic development and leads to abnormal positioning of the cecum and appendix in the right upper quadrant instead of the right lower quadrant and the intestines to the right side of the abdomen. With midgut volvulus, the intestines become twisted, leading to obstructed mesenteric blood flow and bowel ischemia. The emesis is bilious in this case because the obstruction is distal to the ampulla of vater, where the common bile duct opens into the duodenum. Malrotation with midgut volvulus is usually discovered by one year of age, but malrotation may present more indolently with intermittent abdominal pain and vomiting, or feeding intolerance and failure to thrive due to intermittent volvulus or partial obstruction of the duodenum secondary to LADS bands. LADS bands are peritoneal attachments that connect the cecum to the lateral abdominal wall in malrotation, where the cecum is in the right upper quadrant. These bands cross over the duodenum, causing an obstruction. Other causes of intestinal obstruction include abdominal adhesions, masses such as neoplasms, hernias, intussusception, inflammatory bowel disease, and foreign bodies. Emesis of feculent material is indicative of distal intestinal obstruction, such as distal adhesions or Hirschsprung's disease. Coffee-grown emesis or hematemesis suggests inflammation of the upper GI tract. Emesis of bright red blood is indicative of Mallory Weiss tears. A detailed stooling history including number of stools a day, form of stool, and presence or absence of blood in the stool is very important. Gastroenteritis often presents as diarrhea, while hard stools, straining, or lack of stooling signify constipation. Alternatively, decreasing bowel movement frequency may be observed with obstruction. Hematochesia often indicates a left colonic source and may be seen with bacterial infection, colitis, polyps, or local trauma, including anal fissures and hemorrhoids. In addition, IgA vasculitis may be present in bloody stools and children of any age, although it is most common around age 5. Upper GI bleeding can present with melana, which is elicited by asking about dark, maroon, or tarry stools. The classic finding of current jelly stool is highly suspicious for intussusception, particularly in patients aged six months to three years. This occurs when a portion of the bowel, usually involving the terminal ileum and cecum, folds into itself, leading to obstructed blood supply and bowel ischemia. Meckel's diverticulum, lymphoma, intestinal duplication cysts, and polyps may serve as lead points. Physical examination. Physical examination begins with vital signs. General appearance is crucial in assessing illness severity. Children who are not interacting normally with caregivers, have limited response to examination, or limit their movements due to pain are more likely to have serious conditions. Abdominal examination begins with inspection, 
Of particular interest are scars indicative of prior surgeries which predispose to adhesion formation and thus intestinal obstruction, ecchymosis suggested of recent trauma, distension concerning phoresites or bowel obstruction, peristaltic waves highly suspicious for obstruction, or visible abdominal masses. Auscultation can be helpful in evaluating small bowel obstruction when high-pitched or hypoactive sounds are noted. Referred pain from pneumonia can present with abdominal pain. Lung field auscultation may demonstrate crackles or decreased breath sounds. The most important objective of the abdominal exam is to evaluate for an acute abdomen, as this may require surgical intervention. Peritonitis refers to inflammation of the peritoneum, the lining of the abdominal cavity. This can occur in cholecystitis, appendicitis, or bowel perforation. Voluntary guarding or involuntary rigidity both raise concern for peritonitis, though rigidity is more specific. In addition, rebound tenderness upon which pain is worse when the examiner removes their hand rather than during the palpation itself is another sign of peritonitis, though this can be challenging to elicit in younger children. Pain with cough, deep respirations shaking the bed, or specific exam maneuvers be suggestive of peritonitis. The location of abdominal tenderness on exam is crucial. Biliary disease frequently manifests as right upper quadrant tenderness and a positive Murphy sign elicited by palpating. The right costal margin and observing a halt and inspiration due to tenderness is a sensitive maneuver for acute cholecystitis. Several techniques are appropriate for detecting splenomegaly. Beginning in the right lower quadrant, gradually advance hand placement towards the left upper quadrant and utilize the movement of the patient's diaphragm to nudge the spleen towards the examiner's fingers. Appendicitis can occur at any age and classically presents with periumbilical pain that ultimately localizes to the right lower quadrant at McBurney's point, approximately one-third the distance from the anterior superior iliac spine to the umbilicus. Rofsing sign, tenderness to palpation in the right lower quadrant with palpation of the left lower quadrant, and psoas sign, tenderness with hyperextension of the right hip with the patient lying on the left side also support a diagnosis of appendicitis. Tenderness at the costovertebral angle elicited by percussion of the lower back is common in pyelonephritis or nephrolithiasis. Finally, pain originating from the genital urinary system can manifest as abdominal pain so scrotal examination in male patients is necessary to evaluate for testicular torsion and inguinal hernias containing incarcerated bowel. A validated clinical scoring system for torsion comprised of nausea, vomiting, testicular swelling, palpable hard testes, high riding testes, and absent cremasteric reflux. Testicular elevation when the examiner runs one finger along the medial thigh is highly sensitive and specific for torsion. In adolescent females, pelvic examination is important for assessing pelvic inflammatory disease, ectopic pregnancy, and ovarian torsion, or cysts. Differential diagnosis. The differential diagnosis for epigastric pain includes reflux, esophagitis, gastritis, and peptic ulcer disease, usually involving the stomach or duodenum. Ulcers are relatively unusual in children, but more likely to occur with serious illness. As in adults, they're also associated with H. pylori infection and chronic NSAID use. Pancreatitis, described as severe epigastric pain with radiation to the back, is most frequently idiopathic in children, though medications, infections, systemic disease, trauma, and biliary disease have been implicated. Pain may be worse with eating, and patients often prefer the fetal position, lying on one side with hips and knees flexed. Alternatively, it may be poorly localized or present as periumbilical pain. Right upper quadrant is commonly associated with hepatic or biliary disease. Hepatitis may be due to viral infection, medications, including acetaminophen toxicity, or autoimmune conditions, though these are rare and typically do not present with pain. Cholodogolithiasis presents as postprandial pain and most commonly occurs in patients with a predisposition such as obesity, hemolytic conditions such as sickle cell disease, chronic parenteral nutrition exposure, or cystic fibrosis. Pain may be nonspecific or localized to the right upper quadrant and accompanied by vomiting or fever. Acute cholecystitis, which is rare in pediatrics, often presents with fever and severe pain that radiates to the back or shoulder. Medical history is important in assessing left upper quadrant pain as hemolytic disease predisposes patients to splenic sequestration and blunt force trauma can lead to splenic rupture or laceration, 
Consideration of more common conditions such as referred pain from pneumonia or pyelonephritis is important for upper quadrant pain. The differential diagnosis for left to lower quadrant pain includes torsion, ectopic pregnancy, ovarian cysts, hernia, volvulus, gastritis, colitis, and constipation. These conditions also cause right-sided pain. Accurate diagnosis of right lower quadrant pain is challenging given the number of conditions localizing to this region. Rapid assessment for surgical emergencies such as appendicitis must be undertaken. Other serious diseases warranting timely diagnoses includes bowel perforation, intussusception, and Crohn's disease. Periumbilical pain without other red flags is common with constipation and is most frequently the underlying cause. Food intolerance, such as lactose intolerance, functional abdominal pain, and celiac disease are other common etiologies of periumbilical pain. In rare cases, it may represent an early appendicitis or another serious condition such as volvulus, IgA vasculitis, bowel obstruction, or gastroenteritis. Pain overlying the bladder is typically attributed to cystitis, but may be due to colitis or constipation. In sexually active female adolescents, pelvic inflammatory disease must also be considered. Laboratory testing. Laboratory data is rarely diagnostic without red flag symptoms. Complete blood count, erythrocyte sedimentation rate, and C-reactive protein establish evidence of systemic inflammation, which supports infectious diagnoses like appendicitis, pancreatitis, cholecystitis, pyelonephritis, and pneumonia. In addition, non-infectious causes of inflammation leading to abdominal pain, like Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis, may present with elevated inflammatory markers, as well as anemia. Urinalysis demonstrating pyuria or bacteria signifies urinary tract infection. Pancreatic enzymes elevated three times above the upper limit of normal is part of the diagnostic criteria for pancreatitis. Bilirubin is likely to be elevated with acute biliary obstruction or cholecystitis. Transaminase elevation raises concern for acute hepatitis. IgA antibodies against tissue transglutaminase performed while on a gluten-containing diet are the most reliable screening test for celiac disease. Postmenarchal females should undergo urine pregnancy testing to evaluate for ectopic pregnancy. Imaging. Multiple imaging modalities exist for evaluating abdominal pain. If history and physical exam is concerning for intestinal obstruction, abdominal radiography may show signs of air fluid levels and paucity of air in the rectum. An abdominal x-ray should not be performed to evaluate for constipation. Instead, a history and physical examination should be used to determine if a patient is constipated. Upper GI series is the imaging study of choice for malrotation. The utility of ultrasound in identifying abdominal pathology is increasingly recognized. Preferential use of sonography over CT in suspected appendicitis is associated with lower rates of negative appendectomy when an appendectomy is performed in patients without appendicitis on pathology. Ultrasound is the preferred imaging study for diagnosing intussusception, cholecystitis, gallstones, and ovarian torsion. CT or MRI is often performed for the evaluation of appendicitis, particularly in uncooperative or obese patients when sonographic technical expertise is lacking or when ultrasound is equivocal. CT is also the preferred imaging modality for complications with pancreatitis. MRI is time-consuming and sedation may be required in younger patients. This has limited its widespread adoption. Summary in summary, the differential diagnosis of acute abdominal pain is governed by many factors, including associated symptoms, localization of pain, examination findings, patient age, and to a lesser extent, laboratory testing. Thank you for watching this video on acute abdominal pain.